So good evening everybody. Apollo 13. This talk was written to celebrate the 50th anniversary which was in April this year. Uh, I had a number of Apollo 13 talks lined up for, for different societies, uh, most of which got cancelled for obvious reasons. So it's nice to be able to resurrect it and actually give it uh, even if we have to give it in these unusual circumstances via Zoom rather than in person. Apollo 13 started much the same as the other Apollo launches with a Saturn V. Apollo 8, which went to the moon, Apollo 9, remember, only took the spacecraft into Earth orbit so didn't need the Saturn V launch. Apollos 10, 11, 12 were the previous missions which all launched with the Apollo Saturn V rocket. Everything went pretty much to plan. And of course, the astronauts on board were these fellows here. In the middle, we have Commander Jim Lovell. On the right, Lunar Module Pilot Fred Hayes. And on the left, Command Module Pilot Jack Swigert. It was originally going to be Ken Mattingly. But a few days before launch, Ken Mattingly was exposed to German measles. And so they had to do a last minute swap. And so Jack Swigert uh, took his place from the backup crew. Now, I'm not going to take you through the nitty-gritty detail because A, that would be too long, and B, it's already been covered in enough detail already. The full story of Apollo 13 accident, the full mission, and of course the heroic efforts of those in mission control to get the three astronauts back to Earth safely, that was all immortalised by Hollywood in the 1995 film. Yes, it was 1995. This famous film was 25 years ago, one quarter of a century. Only seems like yesterday, but there we go. So if you're going to make a Hollywood film about Apollo 13, you need to have somebody playing the part of a heroic astronaut. Who would you choose? Well, first choice was Buzz Lightyear, but he was otherwise engaged. So they went through a few alternatives. The command module pilot, Jack Swigert, was played by Kevin Bacon. Uh, the commander, Jim Lovell. Jim Lovell's preference, he says, would have been Kevin Costner. And perhaps you can see the resemblance and why he thought that would be a good idea. But they went with Tom Hanks. And for lunar module pilot, Fred Hayes, we have Bill Paxton. So those are the three actors who play the uh, heroic astronauts. But I'm not going to dwell on that because it's a Hollywood film. If you haven't seen it, why haven't you seen it? It's a fantastic film, so I'm not going to go through all of the details that are covered in the film. But I'm going to point you to another immortalization. Yes, the accident and the mission and the role of mission control was immortalized by the Hollywood film, but perhaps you weren't aware that it was also immortalized in Lego. Ha! There you go. The uh, Lego Apollo 13 set. Spacecraft in the background there, and of course the three astronauts, but you can see the importance that they place on mission control. It's not just the spacecraft and the three astronauts. More than half of the entire Lego set is taken up by the mission controllers. Let's have a look at a little more detail. We have the big screen in the background, we have three mission controllers, and in the front there we have one of the mission control desks, big red telephone and the uh, emergency plans for Apollo 13, the emergency manual if you like, and perhaps most importantly the cup of coffee, which made sure that mission controllers managed to do what they did. If we have a look at those three mission controllers, let's look at those figures in a little more detail. In the middle there we have a flight director, not named, but I presume that must be Gene Kranz. You can tell it's Gene Kranz because he's wearing a white waistcoat or vest. This is the signature of Gene Kranz. Not just the steely gaze, not just the buzz cut haircut, but the white vest gives him away as Gene Kranz. On the left we have the flight dynamics officer looking very proud of himself with his little pocket protector and his slide wall in his pocket. And on the right we have a rather nervous looking aeronautical engineer. There must have been a lot of those in mission control trying to work out how to get the astronauts home after the problem they encountered. The astronauts themselves in Lego here. In the middle we have Jim Lovell, the commander, smiling nicely. On the right we have lunar module pilot uh, Fred Hayes, 
with a little bit of a smirk on his face, but notice that the Lego figures for Schweiger there, the Command and Service Module pilot on the left, he seems to be grimacing. Perhaps that's because um, Swigert was in charge of the command and service module and that's where the problem originated and therefore most of the responsibility for trying to fix the problems fell on Swigert. So perhaps that's why Lego decided to give him the rather grimacy face that he's got there despite the fact that Jim Lovell is smiling through the whole mission. There's the spacecraft itself the lunar module on the left, the command and service module on the right, and the problem arose because of uh, an explosion in this part of the service module, and the LEGO kit comes either pre-explosion, or if you wish, post-explosion, blowing a panel off, exposing some of the guts where an oxygen tank blew up and took out the fuel cells, which we'll mention again in just a moment. So it's nice that the kit comes, if you like, before and after. You can see that it's not a particularly large model. model. There's not much detail in the either the command or the service module or the lunar module when the kit is to this particular scale. If you were interested in a LEGO, module, uh, a LEGO model of the lunar module, then you wouldn't necessarily choose this particular kit. There are other kits available, for instance, one explicitly of the Apollo 11 lunar yeah. module. Would you, would you mind muting? Thank you. So here we have a, a model of the lunar module made to a, a higher scale which gives you more detail and this one was made for the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 landing. But if we just get our abbreviation sorted for what is coming next, um, this part of the Apollo spacecraft is called the service module, the cylindrical part of this system. In the middle we have the conical shaped command module and on the right we have the lunar module. And these are given the abbreviations throughout all of NASA missions, SM for the service module, CM for the command module and LM for the lunar module. And because the service module effectively provides services to the command module and those particular parts of the spacecraft stay together for most of the mission, they are often combined together. The service module and the command module together are referred to as the command and service module or CSM is a common abbreviation. So let's have a look at what the mission was supposed to be. This is a standard, if you like, a standard Apollo mission to give us an idea of how the mission was interrupted by the problem with Apollo 13. So here we have the command and service module and the lunar module leaving the Earth on the way to the moon. It takes about three days to get there and our heroic astronauts spend a fair bit of their time in the command module but when they approach the moon, then two of the astronauts move through the connecting tunnel into the lunar module. Then they seal the connection between them so that they can separate. And then the two uh, astronauts in the lunar module, the commander and the lunar module pilot, will then go down to the surface, whilst the command module pilot will stay with the mothership orbiting the moon. In this particular case, the, uh, the lunar module didn't land at the North Pole. This is, of course, just schematic. They actually landed, uh, were intending to land, rather, in this particular area of the moon that I'm showing with the cursor down here. Once they had completed their mission, they would have got back into the lunar module and then the ascent stage would have gone back up to orbit to dock with the command module. The descent stage of the lunar module would stay on the moon. Once they had docked, the two astronauts would have then gone back into the command module and now the ascent module of the lunar module has completed its mission. It's no longer required. There's no point in taking it back to Earth. That would just be more luggage, more fuel required to move that much mass back. So at this point, the lunar module would be jettisoned as no longer required. And then the three astronauts in the uh, command module would then make their way back to Earth, another three-day journey approximately back to Earth. Once, they've, once they were within a few hours of uh, arriving at Earth, the service module had then completed its part of the mission. It no longer required to feed power or oxygen or water to the astronauts, so the service module at this point would be jettisoned, leaving the three astronauts in the command module. And then it's just a question just a question of entering the Earth's atmosphere and splashing down in the ocean. Kusploosh, there we are. 
this particular graphic of Earth doesn't have the Pacific in the right position. They were going down into the Pacific. This looks like it's gone down in the Indian Ocean. That's just because I haven't got the right view of the Earth in this particular uh, cartoon here. So that's how it was supposed to happen. That's how the six or seven day mission was supposed to go. So what actually happened that changed all that? Well, approximately two days into the flight, remember it takes about three days to go from the Earth to the Moon, about two days into the flight there was a problem. A bang. Houston, we've had a problem. Not quite the same as Houston, we have a problem, which is what was actually said in the film because they thought it sounded better, but what was actually said was Houston, we've had a problem. That was Swigert reporting the loud bang and the shuddering of the whole spacecraft. What had actually happened was an oxygen tank has, had exploded. They couldn't see what was going on at the time. I'm showing you here a picture which was taken later in the mission just to give you a little bit of context. That's what actually happened. One panel of the service module completely blew out because of an oxygen tank inside here exploding. That was the result of a fan inside the oxygen tank having faulty wiring insulation so that when they tried to stir the tank, which they do every once in a while with cryogenic um, oxygen, when they stirred the tank, a spark caused the oxygen tank to explode, which then caused a huge overpressure which blew the side panel off the service module and also damaged a lot of the infrastructure in there. As well as reducing the amount of oxygen they had left, rather critically, it also damaged the fuel cells. And the fuel cells are responsible for taking oxygen and hydrogen and combining them to give you electrical power and water. So if you lose the fuel cells, you lose the power capability of powering the rest of the spacecraft. There are multiple fuel cells, but they did not have enough to complete the mission in the way planned. They also lost some of their oxygen, so they were down effectively on oxygen and water and electrical power. So they had serious problems. It was very quickly realised that the best that they can do, because they were losing power very rapidly in the command module, they realised that they had to use the independent systems of the lunar module. So very quickly it was decided by the astronauts and confirmed by mission control that they really ought to transfer into the lunar module and use the lunar module, as it were, as a lifeboat. They effectively powered down the command module because they had so little power available and started using the power reserves of the lunar module. So effectively they switched off the power, they switched off everything, including the computer, the navigation computer, and let the whole thing simply cool down. So the command module became a little bit of an icebox after a little while. Remember this was two days into the mission. They had already thought about what might happen in terms of, excuse me, I just missed some text there. They already had thought about what might happen if they got to the moon and needed to get back to Earth with a crippled command and surface module, which was a three day journey. So they'd already thought about that and already had, as it were, a contingency plan. One of the persons, one of the astronauts that drew up the contingency plans was none other than Jack Swigert, who happened to be on board, the best person you could possibly have under the circumstances. So there was a contingency plan to how to get back in three days if you had a crippled spacecraft. But they were two days out, so if they went to the moon and then back again, they had to survive four days. This was a serious problem. So they continued on to the moon. They figured that there was no way they could simply turn around and go home because that would have required the full thrust of the main engine of the service module. And given that the service module had been damaged, they weren't sure of the state of this engine, so they decided not to risk it, but to rely on the engine on the descent stage of the lunar module. So they decided to continue to the moon, go round the back of the moon, and then return to Earth. But that would be a four-day journey, but it was a calculated risk. So they got to the moon, they fired the lunar module engine, where they would normally fire the service module engine, in order to return back to Earth. That was a long and, I'm sure, very uncomfortable journey. They were in survival mode. They had to do whatever was necessary to make sure they could survive the four days from the accident to the return to Earth. 
They had limited oxygen, limited water, limited electrical power, and they had to make that last. The story of exactly how they did that, of course, is all buried into the, not only is it all in the NASA archives, it's in the wonderful 1995 film of the same name. And so I'm sure you're aware of the fact that they had to power down, it got very cold, they had to worry about the CO2, the carbon dioxide that they were breathing out, and they had to make sure that their carbon dioxide scrubbers managed to take that carbon dioxide back to a safe level. All of that is well documented in the archives and well documented in the film, so I'll say no more about that. It was indeed uh, simply going into survival mode. And I can't believe how grateful they were to see out of their window the Earth getting larger and larger as they realised they were getting closer to closer to Earth and were getting closer and closer to surviving the ordeal and arriving back at Earth. So after four very uncomfortable days they do arrive back at Earth and uh, now they are within hours of arriving back at Earth. So the three astronauts who have been in the lunar module lifeboat for all of this time, they now transfer back into the command module. And there they have to boot up the command module. The command module has been essentially idle for four days and is freezing cold. There's water condensing all over the electrical panels, for instance, the control panels. They had to find a way of booting up the command module with the minimum amount of power possible. And that's where Ken Mattingly, the command module pilot who didn't fly with them because of the German measles threat, he stayed in mission control and he figured out how to reboot the command module from essentially dead to a working system that would get them back home. So once they had rebooted the command module, well, at that point, the service module no longer has a task, and this is the point when they released it that they managed to get that particular photograph. So I showed it earlier for context, but this is the point at which they took a photograph and actually saw, for the first time, the amount of damage that had actually been sustained by the service module. They couldn't actually tell from this photograph whether or not the main propulsion systems were affected, but it was simply a precaution not to use that engine um, in case there was a problem and it could have caused even more problems than they had in the first place. So at this point, all three astronauts are in the command module. They have used all of the power systems from the lunar module. They've used it as accommodation to keep them alive and they've used its power systems to keep them alive and effectively now to keep the command module alive. Now the command module is booted up, they can say goodbye to Aquarius and release and jettison the lunar module. Now they just hope and pray that there's enough power in the batteries in the command module to actually allow them to deploy the parachutes such that once they have come into the Earth's atmosphere they can, as usual, open those parachutes to allow them to descend into the Pacific Ocean, and there they go back with a splash. So we know that's the way it worked out. I'm brushing over the heroics of mission control, managing to make sure that they manage the oxygen, the water, the power, etc., to allow them to last those four days under extremely stressful circumstances. Failure is not an option, is the famous phrase spoken by the actor Ed Harris in the movie but not Krantz himself. Krantz denies ever actually saying that. But the director, Ron Howard, of the Apollo 13 film, talked to various mission controllers and said and asked, how is it you deal with a particular problem that might arise? And the mission controllers had a particular ethos. They said, if a problem shows up, we work the problem. We figure out logically what are the possible options that we have and failure is not one of them. And Ron Howard said, fantastic quote, way too long, let's shorten it to failure is not an option. And then he put it into Ed Harris's script. So Ed Harris came up with the line, as it were, Krantz did not say that, but when Krantz came to write his autobiography some years later, he thought that was such a wonderful quote which reflected so succinctly the attitude of those working in mission control, he decided to borrow the line from the film to write his autobiography. Life imitates art, in a sense. If you haven't read the book, 
Crantz's autobiography. It is a thumping good read, well worth getting hold of and having a read. What happened to the command module? Well, we know it came back to Earth and it's now in a museum. The command module called Odyssey, um, Odyssey, Odyssey made it safely back to Earth with its three occupants. That's, of course, historical fact. What about the other bits of Apollo hardware? Well, the third stage of the Saturn V rocket, after it had accelerated the command and service module and the lunar module on the way to the moon, was given one last task to perform. And that was, instead of missing the moon and going into orbit around the sun, which is what other third stage rockets had done, they deliberately changed the trajectory such that the third stage booster would actually impact the moon. And they did that because the previous Apollo mission, Apollo 12, had set up seismometers. So these seismometers were set up by Apollo 12, they were running, and so they deliberately impacted the third stage booster, a known mass travelling at a known velocity, in other words a known energy, imparted into the crust of the moon, then produced a moonquake that could be recorded by the seismometers. In a sense, it was a way of calibrating the seismometers with a known impact at a known position. So that actually produced a, a useful scientific output and arguably was uh, a successful aspect of the mission before they had the problem, rather the impact was later, but the actual design of that impact to test the Apollo 12 seismometers was a successful element of the mission. I said at the end the lunar module, call sign Aquarius, was jettisoned just before everything re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. The service module and the lunar module would have both entered the Earth's atmosphere along with the command module. The command module with the astronauts is designed to enter the Earth's atmosphere and with parachutes bring them safely to the ocean surface. The service module simply burnt up. But what about Aquarius? Aquarius is a lunar module which of course is only designed to go from moon orbit down to the surface and then the ascent module comes back up again as I showed in that little schematic earlier. So it would be assumed that of course it's very fragile, it will simply disintegrate in the Earth's atmosphere. That's not quite true. It was very important when they decided to bring Aquarius down into the Earth's atmosphere, it was in very it was very important that they did it in a controlled way to ensure that anything that survived fell in to one of the deepest trenches in the Pacific. They actually aimed for the deepest trench in the South Pacific, which was the Tonga Trench. If the lunar module is so fragile, why were they worried about any part of it making it and surviving the disintegration as it came into the Earth's atmosphere? Well, there was one component of the lunar module that they were particularly worried about. It was one component in the lunar module that was never supposed to come back to Earth. It was supposed to be left on the Moon. And that component was the plutonium fuel cask. Here we can see Alan Bean of Apollo 12 removing the plutonium fuel cask from the lunar module to transfer it to the object that's just sitting at his feet there, the so-called RTG. RTG stands for Radioisotope Thermoelectric Generator. By taking plutonium and placing it into this RTG, the RTG takes the radioactivity of the plutonium and converts it into electricity. That was the object, that was the power source that powered all of the surface experiments on the surface of the Moon. And RTGs are also used in spacecraft like, uh, like the Voyager spacecraft and various other spacecraft that go a long way from the Sun, far too far to use solar panels. RTGs are a standard way of generating power. So the lunar module descent stage contains plutonium and it was supposed to stay on the Moon. But because Apollo 13 came back and they needed that lifeboat to keep them alive, they kept everything until arrival at Earth and then they tried to make sure that Aquarius came down in the Tonga Trench in the Pacific Ocean and as far as I know that is indeed where it is. They've gone down the, to the Tonga Trench and checked that the plutonium cask is not leaking to make sure that there's no particular problem there. 
but that's interesting that it was never designed to come home, so in Apollo 13 that's one of the many things they had to think about, as well as simply keeping the astronauts alive, they had to worry about aspects such as what do we do if this comes back to Earth when it was never supposed to. A reminder that mission control had an awful lot of work to do during those few days. This is one of the pictures from the film. Perhaps you're already aware of the fact that when Tom Hanks, playing Jim Lovell, um, arrives on the USS Iwo Jima, the aircraft carrier that picked them up, the actor that played the captain of the USS Iwo Jima, who is that? That's none other than Jim Lovell himself. So here is Jim Lovell shaking hands with an actor playing Jim Lovell. A nice little cameo at the end of the film. Jim Lovell and I think the other astronauts were quite baffled by the amount of media coverage that they received. They were told by Mission Control, of course, that the world is, is hanging with bated breath on their return, but that perhaps they didn't realise just quite how much their jeopardy had caught the public imagination. So they were quite baffled when they read papers and found that the entire Apollo 13 mission and all of the efforts to get them home safely were documented in the various newspapers. The other thing I like about this photo is that it would appear that they've been on Earth for about half an hour or something and already whichever astronaut it is on the left hand side appears to be signing autographs to give out to people. Whether that was simply an edict from NASA, you're alive, you're well, great, now start signing some autographs. I'm not sure if they were quite that dictatorial. Let's just get a little idea of who built what, which is relevant for the next thing I want to show you. The command and service modules are on the left there, the lunar module is on the right. The command and service modules were, were built by a company called North American, who later became North American Rockwell. And on the right, the lunar module was built by Grumman Aircraft, who later became Grumman Aerospace. So they changed their names a little bit during the 60s, but let's not worry about that. The point is that the command and service module normally does all of the heavy lifting. That's where the main engine is. This is what normally does the main job of increasing or decreasing the velocity of the craft, putting them into lunar orbit, getting them out of lunar orbit, getting them home, etc. But this, of course, was not in use during the problems of Apollo 13, so they relied on the engines of the, uh, or the main descent engine of the lunar module during their problems. Not only that, but of course the lunar module acted as accommodation for the whole of the crew for essentially all of the flight from the accident onwards. So for in the lunar module was supposed to be home to two astronauts for two days. It turned out to be home to three astronauts for four days, much more than was originally intended. And because Grumman made the lunar module, and effectively the lunar module is what saved the astronauts and saved the mission and got the astronauts home safely because of the accommodation and because of the engine, Grumman could argue that they saved the mission. And in particular, Grumman Aerospace saved North American Rockwell because the accident occurred on a North American Rockwell spacecraft and the Grumman Aerospace spacecraft got them home. So a few jokers at Grumman Aerospace thought they would have a little bit of a joke on this. Because Grumman had dug a North American Rockwell out of a hole, they decided, well, we've saved the astronauts. Let's invoice North American Rockwell for saving the mission. So a few jokers at Grumman, I'm not sure the heads of Grumman or North American were very pleased with this, but some, some individuals further down the, the, the chain decided to send an invoice from Grumman to North American. So it was from Houston via USS Iwo Jima, and they billed North American the following. They billed them a towing bill. Because they had got the astronauts home over four days by effectively towing or pushing the crippled spacecraft home, they said, here's a towing bill. We're going to charge you $4 for the first mile and $1 for each additional mile. And in remember, it's a quarter of a million miles to the moon. So that adds up, roughly speaking, to a round trip from the accident to home of about 400,000 miles. So they charged them in the invoice here 400, perhaps you can't see it if it's too small, 400,004 dollars. That's the towing fee. 
They were also charged a battery charge fee using the customer's jump cables because power went from the lunar module to the command module via a set of cables that ran through. They also charged a few bits and pieces like oxygen and a few other items. But one of the key things they charged them for was the sleeping accommodation. So the lunar module is supposed to be accommodation for two. And they said, right, um, accommodation for two, uh, no TV, by the way. They were some of the few people that never saw the Apollo 13 disaster unfold because they never had a TV. So sleeping accommodation for two, no TV, air conditioned, with radio, with view. Fantastic accommodation. How much did they charge for that? Well, nothing, because that was what it was supposed to do in the first place. That was already built into the mission that the Grumman lunar module would be sleeping accommodation for two, and therefore that's prepaid. But of course, Grumman realised that it wasn't used by two people. There was a third astronaut in the lunar module, so they charged them for an additional guest in room at $8 per night for four nights, an extra $32. So they're charging them $400,000 for the towing fee, plus an extra $32 for having an extra guest in their room for a few days, for four nights. They also charged them for a few other bits and pieces, and in the end they said no tax is applicable because it's a government contract. So in the end, they sent a bill to North American for $312,000. As far as I know, it was never actually paid. It was an interesting bit of humour on the part of various people, even if the heads of Grumman and the heads of North American were not very impressed with it. As an epilogue, let me describe what went on here. This is Odyssey, the command module being dragged out of the ocean uh, by the crew of the USS Iwo Jima and being brought to rest to be taken back stripped down and put into a museum. Before they put it in a museum, they remove a lot of this thermal insulation. You can see a lot of it has burnt away anyway when it comes into the Earth's atmosphere. The compression of the air produces heat, which tends to ablate the heat shield and also comes, cause a little bit of damage to the outer surface here. And some of this thermal shielding has been stripped away. Before it goes into a museum, they will take all of this thermal shielding off. It looks a little bit sort of like gold leaf almost. It's actually gold on one side and, um, and silver on the other. It's a sort of a, a mylar material. I'm telling you this because a lot of this material was taken off. Perhaps some of it was thrown away, but certainly a lot of it was kept by some of the technicians that were doing it. And some of this material from Odyssey was given to museums or bought by museums. And some museums make it available. They've taken relatively large areas of many, many square centimetres, and they've chopped it up into tiny bits and they've sold it. I can tell you that because I decided to buy a little bit of Odyssey. So if I can get the camera back, thank you. So uh, this is a little bit of Odyssey. The material that you can get on the outside can be bought from a museum and I'm sure you can't actually see it, but right in the middle of this little display box where, where my finger is pointing is a tiny piece of the thermal insulation that came off the command module Odyssey. So I, I have my own little personal piece of Apollo 13. I'll show you that a little bit closer perhaps afterwards if you wanted to get a better view of it. And my final slide is this one showing a lineup of six astronauts and three flight directors from 2015. So this would have been the 45th anniversary of Apollo 13. So we have Charlie Duke standing up at the rostrum on the left. Uh, I, I believe he was the one that actually exposed the crew to um, German measles. And so he was responsible for the swap of Ken Mattingly with uh, Jack Swigert. Jack Swigert, unfortunately, uh, died some years after uh, Apollo 13 in 1982, so he's missing from this lineup. But in the lineup seated there, we have uh, Jim Lovell, we have Fred Hayes, and then we have three flight controllers speaking into the microphone there. We have Gene Krantz, next to him is Glyn Lunny, and then we have Jerry Griffin, and then finally three more astronauts, Vance Brand, Jack Luzma, and Joe Kerwin. As far as I'm aware, all of those individuals are still alive five years later for the 50th anniversary. 
Of course they will be in their 80s now, so they were talking in, in 2015 about NASA's finest hour, which is uh, one of the things that, um, that Gene Kranz said at the time. Yes, it was a disaster that they had that, uh, that explosion and almost caused the death of three astronauts, but it was NASA's finest hour to turn it around and get them home safely. And there we have a few uh, octogenarians, and of course they will now be in their mid-80s, some of them might even be in their late 80s by now. And it's sad to think that it won't be too long before we won't be able to line up a group of people who can remember and be a part of the Apollo era. Sad to think, but of course, inevitable. Thank you all for listening.